instance, does it quite require that we sacrifice our children? Thank God for that. You know, like the ancient Israelites fell into that form of idolatry where they would actually take their little children and throw them on a, on a, on a pyre, which was a fire that had some molten hands sticking out there to bail, or throw them into a fire and sacrifice their own little beloved children. I can't even imagine a mother or parents being so persuaded with such an evil practice to actually do something like that. We don't have to cut ourselves. We don't have to go through the process of flagellation where we take a whip, walk around, and beat our backs until blood runs out our bare backs. As a form of penance, by the way, we aren't forbidden to marry and live the celibate life, both men and women. We're not, we're not made to have a vow of silence, although I wish some people would take that vow. We don't have to crawl five miles on our knees. We don't have to wear a hijab or whatever it's called that we cover, the women cover all your faces and just your eyes looking out so that you can't, it'd be a sin for you to even expose, you know, your wrist or your hands or whatever. We don't have to worship cows. We don't give ourselves over to the shamans who claim to communicate with spirits. And I wonder if they actually can communicate with evil spirits. And they claim to be able to change the weather for the good or the bad, but they also claim to have, be able to diagnose and cure human failings or sufferings. We don't have to hang by like one group down in southern India by metal hooks. And I mean, this is grotesque beyond imagination. I'm talking about fish hooks hanging from the ceiling. These men will hook these hooks into their backs and hang there for so many hours so that they can, you know, get right with God, I guess. Their God, their form of God, to the Lord Vishnu, or, or even participate in cannibalism. Believe, that, believe it or not, some people actually do that as a form of a religious rite. These strange and many more grotesque practices in the name of religion are not required by our God, and I wrote here a big thank you, God, that we don't have to do that. But I see our nation and other nations around the world giving themselves over into the hands of people that have these type of customs, believe it or not. And as a reminder, I would like to say who we are today and what we represent and the case and our case that our God is the only God. I'd like to begin in Genesis, the 49th chapter, Genesis 49. I've read this many times to you, but I wanted to give you an idea of what the blessings that God gave to the nation of Israel, one of which was Joseph, who was, remember, you know, cast off by his brothers. He was rejected by his brothers. He was sold into slavery, and yet he was one of the favorite sons of, of Jacob, and when at the end of the book of Genesis, when Jacob is blessing his sons, look what he says about Joseph in verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. He goes beyond his borders, his, his dominion, his blessings, his, uh, you know, the expenditures that he has and the bounty that he has go over his walls. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. How many nations in the world hate the United States? Just think about, or your nation, where you might be from, Great Britain. We have brethren there. We have brethren up in Canada. We have brethren down in Australia, New Zealand, and many other places around the world that might be progenitors of the nation of Israel, of Ephraim and Manasseh that we believe to be uh, the forefathers of, of Great Britain and the United States. And you can pr easily prove that. How many dollars... As the United States spent, I remember watching films in high school of the boatload of grains that we were sending to foreign nations, to places like Africa and the starving nations. How, many, uh, how much money in industrial technology, how many medicines and resources, military aid, and you know the humanitarian aid have we spent over the last 20, 30, 40 years? I, it dawned on me this morning... Today, or this week, or this month, I guess, is 20 years since I've been standing in this podium. And that just blows my mind. I can't believe this month, 20 years ago, I was standing up here shivering and shaking in my teeth and nervous as I could be. 
was the first time that I came down to Tyler and began sort of co-pastoring here in, in, in these services in Tyler. And that time has flown by. But during all of that time, and even back when I was in high school and watching these films about what America was doing, and people used to stand up and sing, this is my country, the land of the free. And they would sing patriotic songs, and movies were patriotic. We were talking this morning about all the trash that's out there on movies and television now. And once was wholesome, and if you want to call it square, you know, television programming, a lot of us old folks, I guess, are going back and watching these old westerns and these old uh, shows from the 60s and 70s because it's about all we can stand anymore. One of the things that I did notice, though, and my son told me this morning, is there's a show out called The Chosen. Maybe you've seen a little bit of it. I watched some of it. I think some of it is excellent. You know, it's a portrayal of the life of Jesus, and it's sort of down to earth. He doesn't look like some weird hippie like we did back in the 60s when he'd have a stare that looked like he had a thousand-yard stare, some sort of weird guy that he would look at somebody and say, follow me, and sort of mystic, you know, sort of a, mysteri a mysterious way of calling people, and they would be under his spell. You know, that's the way they portrayed it. This is more like a real guy and the real feelings, real human feelings that he had as, as a human here on this earth. Daniel told me this morning, you know, I used to brag about the movie The Ten Commandments. It was one of the most watched shows on television around the time of the Passover or what the world calls Easter. It was the most viewed movie in like 25 or 30 years running. Now that was astonishing. But Daniel told me this morning that this movie, The Chosen, has been viewed over 600 million times worldwide. That just shocked me when I heard that statistic. That means people are hungry to hear that message, the message of Jesus Christ, his story, the gospel message. Can you imagine if we had a program that was going out over 600 million people strong, and by the way, that movie and that whole production was funded by the people, the viewers, the people that, the guy didn't have enough money. Hollywood didn't want to have anything to do with it. So the people, he began a, a you know, a sort of a support group, and they began to donate money, and the people donated money enough to begin this series. And it was so well-liked that he began another uh, year of it. And, of course, I don't know, I think they're in season three or four now. But some of it is not accurate. I mean, there are some things in there meant for entertainment purposes, I believe. But by and large, I think it's a pretty good uh, rendering. And it really gives the real feel of the moment of some of those instances. But here it says, uh, of of Joseph, the archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him. I think about all the world wars that we have participated in. In many cases, it wasn't our fault, wasn't our, you know, the reason that we attacked, just aggressively attacked. We were always on the defense, it seems like. Did you know that we lost 407,000 soldiers in World War II? The greatest war that we lost soldiers in was the Civil War, where over a half a million soldiers died. But do you know how many Russian soldiers were lost in World War II? 8.7 million soldiers. I mean, it just drives home the point of the idiocy and the lunacy of war and people who want to take over other lands at the cost of... And these, are just, these are just soldiers. These are just military participants, not... The civilian statistics, would, would they're all over the board. All, as much as 60 to 90 million people died in World War II. But they've shot at him and they've hated him. But, this, but his, his bow abode in strength. Listen to this. And, his, and the arms of his hands were strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From, the, from thence is the shepherd the stone of Israel. I like the way that he wrote this. No matter how many times his enemies, whether they were his own brethren who sold him into Egypt or whether when he went to Egypt, remember he, he had Potiphar's wife to deal with and threw him in prison for two years. God protected him and often it was out of envy, trust, a, a lust, uh, trying to oppress or defraud him. The more he was persecuted, it seems like the more his uprightness and virtues shone through. I like that about Joseph. Here was this pauper to princess story. 
You know, he was sold into slavery, rejected by his own family. He was rejected by his own kin. And when you read that story, you sort of see a little glimmer of the story of Jesus, who was also rejected by his own and brought about their salvation. You know, ultimately, the brothers of Joseph came there during the famine. You know, they had forgotten, I guess, what Joseph had uh, what Joseph had done for Pharaoh. You remember back in, uh, well, let's go back there and read that, uh, Genesis 41. Just back, it's only a few pages back. And Pharaoh, you know, he gathered up all of his soothsayers, and Joseph interpreted this dream for him. And when he did, he told him of a famine that was about to come to, to, into uh, being there in Egypt for seven years. And look what Pharaoh said in verse 38. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, all of his people that are around after Joseph interpreted this dream, can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? Wow. Oh, they had forgotten about that. They had completely forgotten about all of that when the time came to, to put you know, the nation of Israel into slavery. Uh, they had forgotten what Pharaoh say, told Joseph when he had predicted this family, or this famine, I should say. And later when the small beginning, uh, uh, the beginning family of Israel with Jacob, their father, began to be affected by the famine that was in the land, they found themselves before Joseph whom they had rejected and cast out, but became their salvation, as does Jesus. I, I, and, and I wrote here in this story, you can see the comparison of the story of Jesus, who was rejected by his own kinsmen, who will someday stand before him, Jesus Christ, that is, and be searching for their own salvation, those that rejected him. In the Exodus, the seventh chapter, over here in the book of Exodus, I wanted to give a couple examples here of what was going on in Egypt and what God said about what was going to happen during those ten plagues in verse seven, chapter 7 in verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I've made, the, made you a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. And you shall speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of the land. Of course, he went in and said, let my people go. You remember the movie, the line. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh shall not hear, hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth my, mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And that was what those ten great plagues were going to do, one right after another after another. And by the way, those plagues didn't take place in a week. It's, it's, it's very probable that it took a whole year of several days of a plague happened, and then it would have to rescind. We'll look at some of those. And look at verse 5. This is the point I wanted to make. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch my hand upon the Egypt and bring out the children of Israel among them. We can see this being portrayed over in the next chapter, chapter 8. We'll look at a couple examples here. Of course, for, uh, one here, we'll jump into the middle of these. This was when the frogs came up out of the river. And, you know, it just, can you imagine, I think it was somewhere, where was it, that they had a frog plague here in the 20th century, 21st century. No, the 20th century. I remember seeing, it may have been Australia. I know that Australia had a plague of mice at one time. It was just, it was almost overwhelming where they had to broadcast. I remember seeing them broadcasting quinine because you'd go out in a barn and lift up a basket and about 200 mice would run in all directions. One guy, I remember seeing the video where he opened the door and it looked like water running out of his barn. There were so many hundreds and thousands of mice. And, uh, but there was one occasion where they had a plague of frogs, and I can't remember where it was. I remember seeing the video or the, the, the uh, documentary about it. A guy walked into his bedroom, and his little daughter had a frog in her mouth. How sickening. Can you imagine frogs all in your house and in your dwelling place? You know, they didn't have doors and seals like we do on our doors now. I picked up a little bug back here in the back while ago, a little worm that had slivered in under the door. He's a little tiny thing. Barely could see him on this carpet here put him back outside where he belongs. 
But here this plague of frogs came, and Pharaoh beseeched Moses, please stop this plague. And, of course, Moses said in verse 9, uh, Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me, when shall I entreat for thee and for your servants and for your people to destroy the frogs from thee and your houses, that they may re remain in the river. In other words, we're gonna, I'm going to ask God that the frogs will stay in the river and not be here in the land. And he said, Tomorrow, and he said, Be it according to your word, that you may know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. That's the point I'm trying to make here. Moses was trying to portray this to Pharaoh, whose hard-heartedness wouldn't let him see that there's no one else. There's no other God. No one is like God. In chapter 20, uh, later on in that same chapter, down in verse 22, it says, And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, where no swarms of flies. Now this one really cr makes my skin crawl, because I cannot stand flies. We have a rash here down in East Texas of these little chicken farms. And it's not like the old-fashioned chicken houses like my dad and I went to when we were young. We'd go over to a pickup truck and a couple of shovels, and we'd back up to one of these uh, chicken houses where they had pushed all of you-know-what out in the back. And we'd shovel it up, and I'd think, oh, this is the awfulest smell I've ever smelled. And we'd take it back home and spread it in our garden, and Dad would get out there and till it up and down. And, man, he grew some of the greatest crops you ever, you've ever seen because it makes really good fertilizer. Now they put these chicken houses up like 8 to 16 at a time right side by side. I mean, it is unbelievable. And each house, I think, holds uh, 20,000 chickens. So when you eat a chicken breast, you know where it comes from, these chicken houses. But it was about two or three years ago, my wife and I were sitting out on the back porch, and I mean, the flies were everywhere. And I realized, we found out, there's not a quarter of a mile down from the road from our house. They had put in one of these chicken farms recently. And ever since then, we've not had any problems. So evidently, at one point, it got out of control, and the flies hatched out. And I'm a you know, half, quarter to half a mile away, and they were still around my back porch and driving me crazy. But here the whole land was full of the flies. And he said, no, no, form of, no swarm of flies shall be there to the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. So he told the children of Israel, I'm going to send this swarm of flies. It's going to drive the Egyptians crazy, but you're not going to have any come into your house. And they saw that. They witnessed that. And he says, and I will put a division between me, my people, and thy people tomorrow. This shall be the sign. And the Lord did so, and there was a grievous swarm of flies in the house of Pharaoh and his servants. And I can imagine just, you know, they probably didn't take long to dial up Moses and say, please stop this misery, you know, because I can't even imagine trying to eat. I remember going into a restaurant out in West Texas one time, and I walked in. The guy invited me to go to a restaurant that he bought, and he was operating. And I sat down, and I could not, I was afraid to open my mouth. There were so many flies in that building because they were swarmed in there. I didn't want to eat any of the food. I mean, it was, I couldn't wait to get out of there. It was awful. It, I can't imagine a plague of flies. So again, another example, it makes you wonder though, what is it going to take for some people? Is it going to take a plague of monumental or biblical proportions to change the mind and heart of some people? I, I see people in government, I know they're lying. You can tell they're lying. They know they're lying. And you know that they're lying about what they're trying to portray to us. And it just, it dumbfounds me that someday you're going to have to give an account for every word that comes out of your mouth. In Exodus, the 10th chapter, over here one more page, Exodus 10 and verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, go unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of the servants, that I might show these my signs before him, and that thou mayest tell in the ears of your son and your son's son, so your children and grandchildren, what things I have wrought in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that you may know how that I am the Lord. I really want to focus in on that statement. I want our country to focus on that statement because we have so turned our backs and thumbed our nose at God and what else, you know. We've gone after every sort of illicit thing in our country. 
we've hated God, we rejected his word. God's word says, thy word is truth. You want truth? Where do you go to find it? Where in the world would I go to discover truth? You know, some people get up some sort of, I need to go over into China somewhere and get, uh, you know, the guru there or whatever it is and, and listen to him. Maybe he's got some truth. I see some movie stars do that. I need to go to Vietnam and really get down in the bowels of some of their ancient religions, maybe that are thousands of years old. Maybe truth is there. He says, thy word, my word is truth. Jesus said that, thy word is truth. This is where it's at. You want to solve all the problems of the world? You want to solve all the problems of this nation? You want to solve all the problems in your community, in your marriage, wherever it is? It's right here, if people will only look, but they throw that book away. I, I can pick, you can go to garage sales and pick up Bibles by the dozens. I've done it. I picked up little Bibles and little study Bibles and little bitty small Bibles. I got one beside my reading desk I love. It's a little tiny Bible. It was a wedding Bible because in the very first page of it, it says, you know, between this couple, they never wrote their name in there. And by the way, that there was a name on the front of the Bible that's been scratched out. So that didn't even last. They didn't even open this Bible to see how to have a happy and uh, uh, have a happy marriage. But all the answers are there. And, uh, oh, I want to finish that. And you may tell your sons, And Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? I would like to ask all the House of Congress and all the senators, the president and the vice president, all the officers in our country, all the generals, male or female, how long will you Refuse to humble yourself before, before God. Let my people go that they may serve me. And, of course, that was the beginning of the Exodus there and the first Passover for the nation of Israel. I would like to be in the House of Commons and ask that question. And I would like to be down in the parliaments of maybe Australia and up in Canada, whatever their form of government is, and ask the leaders how long are you going to go down this road we're going to rejecting God and dismissing his way of life, morality, and uh, going down these deceitful paths that you think are going to bring you riches and happiness and power? What do you think God is going to ignore all of that or not keep a record of it? What about our nation? In Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, verse 33, Deuteronomy 4 Verse 33, and I ask the question here, what about our nation? Deuteronomy 4 and verse 33, did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire? You know, when Moses was there and he heard this voice, it said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am, and probably trembling fell out on his feet. And he said, remove your feet, your shoes from off your feet, your sandals. For the ground on which you stand is holy ground. Now, I don't know what was going through Moses' mind. I probably scared him half to death. All the other men of the Bible that I read that had encountered this great being were terrified and thought they were going to die. Many of them thought they were dead until a hand reached out and grabbed them by the hair of the head or by the shoulder and strengthened them because all of their strength left them. Has that ever happened to you? There's a couple of times that I've been so terrified because I almost had a terrible accident, possibly, car wreck. You know how you get that feeling of gut-wrenching, uh, the adrenaline rush, and you think, I could have been killed. I mean, it was that close that I didn't see that car. I remember going out in West Texas. No, I was in Oklahoma one time. I stopped at a red light out there in the middle of the plains, and I was sitting there looking down at my phone, while the light was red, and I looked up, and it turned green, and I took my phone, and I laid it down, and I looked this way, and I was about to go, and here come an 18-wheeler. My light had been green for five or six or seven seconds. Had I just taken off, I mean, I would have been T-bowed by this massive truck. And I didn't even, wasn't even any accident in my heart still raced and scared me half to death. There's been other close calls like that. He says, what? God speaks out of the midst of the fire, and you've heard and lived. It says the people of Israel 
heard the voice of God. And of course, when they heard, they were afraid. They ran off and said, you speak to God. I'm scared to death. I'm afraid if we listen to him and hear him any longer, we're going to die. Now, there are prophets, so-called self-appointed prophets and priests and men that stand up in pulpits and on television and say they talk to God. I don't believe them. I'm sorry. I'm sorry because it's nothing I don't believe to be bragging about. Because I think if God does speak to a person, they're going to be so broken, so humbled, so terrified at the voice that came to speak with them that they would be afraid to brag about it. Don't you, doesn't that seem logical to you? It does to me. I mean, the men and the stories that I read in here, these men were, they were frightened. They were humbled. They were terrified by the mighty power of God that he portrayed to them. He says, Oh, has God essayed to go and take a nation for the midst of another nation by great trials or temptations, by signs and by wonders, by war, by the mighty hand, and by the stretched out arm, and by great, great terrors or calamities like he did in Egypt, according to all the Lord your God did to you in Egypt before your eyes. All of these were a show of God's power, and Pharaoh wouldn't listen over and over again until it killed his own son. Would he listen? And unto thee it was showed that you might know that the Lord, he is God, and there is none else beside him. I wrote here, then who then do we owe our allegiance? To the government? Hardly. To men? No way. To our heritage? No, not really. To God alone is our country. Our country was given to us as a great, mighty blessing from God Almighty. And we are acting like we did all of this, that we uh, made this nation great, that we you know, produced all these products and had all this technology. Uh, Deuteronomy 33 Let's go here to the end of the book of Deuteronomy and we'll move on. Another story I want to get in here before we quit. Boy, the time goes by so fast. I, I mean, I can't believe it. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 26. Deuteronomy 33. It's right here at the end here. In verse 26, beginning in verse 26. This is when Moses blesses all the tribes. Now, these are. this is years later. After they came out, of over 400 years after Jacob had blessed his 12 sons, now those 12 sons have become 12 nations or groups of people, families, and Moses is now blessing each one of these groups of Benjamin and Asher and Dan and Gad and Ephraim and Manasseh. When he gets down at the end of that, after blessing all of them, he said, There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, who rides upon the heaven in thy help and his excellency on the sky. The, the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. I like to think of God sitting there holding up his nation, Israel. The nation, by the way, that he promised would endure forever. He says, um, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall, de say, destroy them. Just like he did in Joshua's day when they went out and they drove out these pagan people with all of their evil practices, which included uh, infant sacrifice to their pagan gods and all of their weird and sexual uh, behaviors and witchcraft and necromancy and all of that. He drove them out. Israel then shall dwell in safely alone. The foundation of Jacob shall be upon the land of corn and wine. I think about, you know, the corn belt of Illinois and Iowa and Ohio across there. And then it says in the wine, I think about the California vineyards and some of the places Judy and I went when we traveled out to California in the wine valleys there. Also his heavens shall drop down dew, have rain in due season. Even though I don't really like the rainy days like today, I looked out in my little garden patch out there and thinking, boy, that ground is getting saturated with some really good early rains, and we'll need it later on. Hopefully that soil is retaining some of that moisture so that our garden will grow really good. Happy are you, O Israel, who is likened to thee, O people, saved by the Lord. 
the shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thy excellency, thy majesty. And thine enemies shall be found liars unto you. My margin here says they will submit unto you. You know, all the wicked, all the liars, all the people that have pulled all kinds of chicanery in our government, right down to the local governments, right down to your neighbor next door. And he says, and thou shalt tread upon their high places, which means their pagan places of worship. All of their pagan idolatrous places shall be cast down and put down and out. Uh, I want to go to 1 Samuel, the second chapter here, because this was a lady that wrote this part of the Bible, actually, or probably Samuel recorded it, but it was, um, uh, let's see, what did I tell you the verse was there? 1 Samuel, the second chapter, in verse 1, this is the story of Hannah. This is actually a prayer or song that she sang or wrote. And it, because God had given her a child who would become the prophet Samuel. Look what she says. There is none holy as the Lord, verse 2. For there is none besides thee, neither is there any rock like our God. And of course, God was called the, the rock of our salvation. Jesus was called the chief cornerstone. It says that that rock that followed him was Christ in, the, in 1 Corinthians. Uh, David called him our rock and our fortress. Um, Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. I attest to that. People should really think about that. All of their actions are weighed in the balances. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they stumble and are girded with strength. They that are full have hired themselves out for bread, and they that are hungry, they've ceased to be hungry. It's almost a re role reversal here. So that the barren hath, hath borne seven, and she that had many children waxes feeble. The Lord is, kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave, and he brings up. Talking, I like to think about the resurrection. Or those that are downtrodden are going to be lifted up. The Lord makes poor. He makes rich. He brings low. He lifts up. He raises up the poor out of the dust, and he lifts the beggar from the dunghill to set him among princes, as we read of Joseph was an example of King David who was out there tending sheep. Next thing he knows, he's king over all of Israel. How about that? You talk about a pauper to prince's story. I love that story. And to make them inherit the throne of glory for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. I like to, man, you talk about God standing there holding the whole earth in his hands. You know, they say the song we used to sing as kids, He's got the whole world in his hands. God's awesome power has the ability. He has the authority. He has the wherewithal to fix the problems we have in this world. He could do it here in our country, in whatever country you live, if we would only beseech him and cry out to him and call out his name and fast and pray and repent. He would solve the problems in our cities. He would solve the problems in our government and our leaders. He would solve the problems in our little towns and in our homes and in our marriages and our families. He can do that. But we don't want him in our life. That's the problem. That's the problem in our country. We do not want God in our life. I was watching a program the other day. It was an introduction to a, a new movie or series that's coming out. And they said, this one is going to be bloodier than anything you've ever seen. And I said, good, I'm glad you pre-warned me so I'll never even begin to even watch the previews of it. And this was by a bunch of Jewish producers. Now, I love the Jewish people, and I think they're part of the family of Israel. But they have a responsibility, and we're supposed to have the responsibility of being the leaders in the nation of Israel when it came to God's law and the oracles of God. And I say with broken heartedness that something like that is, is an abomination to God, in my opinion. And, and, and I'm not just blame, blaming the Jewish people. I mean, that's prevalent in every one of the tribes of Israel that have sold themselves over to debauchery, to heinous crimes and evil acts and, and uh, 
and sin, you know, just sin, basically. Um, first, Second Samuel, the seventh chapter. I want to go over here, Second Samuel, seventh chapter, and maybe we'll wrap it up here. Second Samuel, the seventh chapter. I wanted to read a whole lot more here. There's so much more to do to say here. Second Samuel seven and verse twenty-two. Seven in verse down in verse twenty-two. He says, "Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee; neither is any God any, there any God besides thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And what a what one nation in the earth is like your people? When you look at the productivity, at the wealth, the freedom, the blessings, the riches, and the resources." that we have here in the United States and over in Great Britain and other what we believe to be uh, progenitors of the nation of Israel, their families. It is unprecedented in all the world. I came driving by here the other day by the office here. It was in the middle of the week. I was on my way down to a little town south here called Crockett, south of that on a well. It's about two hours from my office, and I had to take some gas samples out of a well, and I go to a little analysis lab down the road here, not a few miles down the road by the church here. So I saw some of the guys here at the office uh, uh, in the parking lot, and I pulled in and uh, started talking to them. And I was telling them I saw this statistic, and I couldn't believe it, so I went up and, and looked it up to make sure it was true. Did you know, you know, I want you to think a moment about the size of the nation or the continent of Africa. Did you know that these countries, if they were, you know, have you ever played the, the game Tetris where you take pieces and put them together into a perfectly fit where there's no spaces? Did you know if you took the nations of Italy and put it inside the borders of Africa, Germany and France and Spain, and all of Eastern Europe, and Portugal, Japan, Ireland, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, Belgium, India, China, and the United States would all fit within the borders of Africa. That statistic blew my mind when I saw that, of a vast continent. But when you compare that to the riches that we have in this small country, comparatively in size to the United States or Great Britain, an island nation for pity's sake, there's no comparison of what the technology and the, and the wealth and the riches that have come out of our nation. And I think it is a, a testament to the blessings that we were given here. Not saying that that country couldn't have great blessings at some point in time. God said, even to the eunuch, remember he said, if you will take over to my Sabbath day, you will prosper. You will be blessed beyond belief that I will open the windows of heaven and rain down blessings to you. I, I don't have time to finish the rest of my sermon here. I want to finish, though, with a prayer. Not that I'm going to pray. I'm going to read to you a prayer that our Lord had to pray. I think it's time to pray desperately for our nation. I want us to remember who prayed this prayer and who these scriptures were that we recorded here that we read today were speaking, of whom they were speaking. I'm not going to read all this, but I want to get to the gist of it here. And Jesus spoke these words, and he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your son may also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, and he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. I'm reading this out of the uh, New King James Version because it's a little smooth. You know, have you read this before? It's a little confusing. Skipping down to verse 6. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They are yours. You gave them to me, and they kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them 
I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All are mine, all of mine are yours, yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep thou your name, through your name, those whom you have given me, and they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept and have, no, have, no, have none, and none of them is lost, not a one, except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. I do not pray that you would take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also send them into the world. And as for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but for those who will believe me through their word. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one as us that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, and that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. And I have declared unto them your name, and we de will declare it, that the love which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. I haven't read that prayer in a long time. And it means a great deal to me to know that Jesus was there right before he went into the Garden of Gethsemane, made this prayer not only for those people that were with him there, his own disciples and beloved followers, but for us here in the 21st century. And I say this in closing to the leaders of governments and leadership roles. I appeal to you to remember the source of our many blessings, the sustainer of our lives, and the great protector and provider of our way of life. Remember the shepherd, the stone of Israel, and the great spectacle that he made when he manifest himself among our ancient parents who saw the God of Israel and were moved with great fear at his presence. I beseech you to humble yourselves before his mighty hand, lest the anger of our God fall upon our nation as a result of our careless and unholy disregard of his overruling power. To the citizens of our country, make your country proud with your moral and ethical behavior. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Remember John F. Kennedy said that. To promote, righteous, to promote righteousness and holiness and to pray that God will protect you in times of great trouble and call upon him for your salvation. And to those brethren of the church of God, I say, devote your life to your family to your community, to your country, to your brethren, but most of all to our great creator God. For, in, for through him we may find peace and hope, and it is in, in him that we look and wait for. And, of course, we're waiting for the coronation of his kingdom over all the earth. And that will allow us to never give up the hope that we have.